So I, I think some of the uh, the last panel and some of the last questions uh, feed very uh, feed very nicely into this next session, and also it was one of. Uh, uh, France's is, uh, four questions is about the new directions of university industry relations. And we've also expanded that to include also national laboratory and uh, university. Um, and we have representatives from, um, from industry that's been around for a long time. And, and we have new industry that uh, didn't exist 30 years ago, and then with national lab. And our participants are. Um, David uh, Parakic, who's Vice President for Research at United Technology and is Director of um, United Technologies Research uh, Center. And in that role, David develops technology strategies in anticipation of future trends and aligns the research center's breakthrough innovations for transition to UTC's business units to enable their growth. And David, at one point in his career, was also at Georgia Tech. So he was has brought, he really crosses uh, both areas. Uh, next will be uh, Thomas uh, Siebel, who's the founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of C3 uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, and provides a suite of pre-built, customizable um, industry software applications uh, developed on a platform that facilitates the IoT business transformation for organizations. And then we have Dr. Callie Sullivan, who's manager of institutional science and technology investments at the Department of Energy's Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, um, and has uh, really engaged in uh, uh, both industry collaborations and university collaborations through um, uh, many different uh, uh, paths. And so We'll go in order as they are in 15 minutes each, and then we'll have questions from everybody. David. Thank you, Maxine. Uh, delighted to be with you this morning. Uh, thank you for taking time on this very important uh, topic. I myself am a product of engineering centers, and I've spent my whole career at the intersection of uh, university and industry, uh, on the academic side, industrial side, back and forth. Uh, early days at Stanford as a student, uh, working on centers from AFOSR and NASA, uh, one of them three decades later still continues. Interesting in terms of the secret sauce for sustainability of a major research center. Um, spent time at Boeing, uh, as Maxine mentioned, uh, Georgia Tech, pleasure working with Jean-Lou there on multiple centers, and now leading uh, the Global Research Enterprise for UTC. Uh, it, it gives sort of a, a framework and a backdrop for the comments that I'll make. Uh, within the corporation, we touch, if you think of three axes, uh, individual faculty, all the way to clusters of faculty across universities. In terms of companies, both what we do ourselves plus with many corporations. And then from a funding standpoint, what we fund ourselves versus what uh, governments fund and some in between. Uh, and in each of those spaces of that three-dimensional quadrant, uh, things work and work quite well. There are commonalities there. Uh, but how you approach it is different. Uh, IP, for example, is simpler when you're the only one negotiating with one place. When you have 10 different companies, all who have a different perspective and universities, uh, things like that get a little more complex. So I want to make a couple comments this morning. Uh, first, just characteristics I've seen that have worked, sort of regardless of scale and the different centers. Uh, and as you might imagine, we work with uh, centers in different funded centers, not only NSF, but DOE, DARPA, and so on in the U.S., multiple ones in Europe, and also ones in Asia. Uh, secondly, uh, looking forward, I'll tell you a little bit about sort of what we see in terms of trends and challenges and uh, things I think where the shape and the nature of centers might change. First, the characteristics, things that are true of things that are successful and sustainable. Uh, probably comes as no surprise, uh, five things. One is alignment. Uh, what I found many times, and it seems like it'll be trivial, uh, is having a focus on something that's compelling and then you have that, but often someone may be wanting to do research because of the technology Industry may be interested in it for the talent and being able to develop uh, with them and work with them on the product of the university. Uh, and so I think while you can have different goals, the key is alignment. It's no different than in companies, all of whom have different approaches for figuring out how their R&D is leveraged, how it makes benefit, have different metrics and rules for doing that. The key that's common across multiple corporations is when you have alignment with the strategy, when you have alignment with the business and the downstream part. So I think the end and alignment is key and checking that with all the participants, making sure there's alignment in terms of where you're trying to head overall. I think the thing that makes that easy, a second point, is really having a compelling idea. Uh, that seems trivial as well, 
But I found many times where we engage with university partners and say, hey, we could do this. Uh, we have interest in this. And then you say, okay, well, how is this distinct from other parts of the world? The ones that get our attention as industry are the folks that have a compelling idea, something they're new, and they have the critical mass and infrastructure to do something about it of a scale that not everyone else can. Um, that was the third point, the critical mass infrastructure, things to leverage uh, beyond just the people. Uh, fourth is talent and leadership. Uh, we've seen many centers that uh, you say it has all the right ingredients, but the lack of the right leader uh, causes it to fall apart and has to be changed. Uh, and I encourage that. I know we look at it, but often we look at it in terms of resumes, uh, what one brings in terms of profile, past work, but the leadership skills, the management skills, the ability to, to drive a shared vision, things like that are absolutely critical for a center to be successful that otherwise you would think might be, but falls apart for lack of that. And I think that's something that has to be paid attention to. And then the talent of the folks there is key. Uh, so alignment, compelling ideas, critical mass infrastructure, leadership, the last one actually I found is what sustains it, uh, and that's relationship. Uh, I remember doing work early on when I was at Boeing, faculty member at Georgia Tech, no center, joint, no joint work, decided we wanted to do something interesting, no IP agreements or of that sort, went to Kroger on the weekend, bought strawberries, and worked in my lab on a Saturday because there was something we were curious about together. Uh, that relationship has continued over 20 years later uh, and has been a part of numerous centers funded by about a dozen different agencies. Uh, and I see that over and over again. And so I say that, you know, it may be obvious, but why do I say that in this context? The things that we can do and how we fund centers that promote relationship, that promote that continuity, that promote the engagement with people, and not just about the technology and the organizations is really key. Okay, so looking ahead, um, one of the things I see in terms of what's changing is challenges uh, in three realms. Uh, I'll give you the acronym ICE so you can remember it. You know, ICE tends to slow things down. You know, you think about things getting cold, moving slower, and sometimes freezing so it doesn't move. Uh, while I agree with the former speakers that IP, so that's the I, is certainly something we've many times figured out how to solve, and certainly if you have the right people, you can solve it. With movement to first to file in the change in the IP laws, with the complexity of different companies having sort of the same objective like freedom to practice, but approaching it in very different ways, where some would cap liabilities and others would say anything retained in the unaided memory of our staff were free to practice. You have a complexity that unfortunately makes things take too long. Uh, and I think sometimes, you know, the master agreements are helpful and things that governments do are helpful. We, we've done this many times, and I'm amazed how many times we keep reinventing it. I'll give you an example uh, the U.S. National Institutes in Manufacturing, numerous ones, we're a part of many of them. In each one we've been a part of, over a half dozen, every time each partner we go with has a different model for IP. The center once funded has a different model for IP. And I'm thinking, this is all in the same cluster of areas. Why are we reinventing this every single time? And sometimes we're on two different teams on the same call, and each of those teams has a different model. Uh, and so it's not that it's not solvable, but what it does is it in introduces a delay and a pain that's unnecessary. And industry moves at a different clock speed. I think one of the things I've learned moving from university to industry is university, there's the power and value of deliberation. In industry, there's a sense of urgency. Uh, in fact, I learned early on as a kid the value of patience. What I've learned in industry is the value of impatience uh, because the market is fast. And so what you have many times is you have things that are solvable, but you don't have the time to solve it. There's so many other things to focus on. And I think where we can and how we foster things, take some of these issues off the table that don't need to be on the table, that'd be very important. I saw it in Europe too. Uh, worked with a country, the head of a science foundation of a country, major uh, corporations, and we put together a compelling idea for a national center. Uh, the head of the science foundation of that country said we should break out the champagne bottles and celebrate it's such a compelling idea. It took us three years before we finally signed the co collaboration document. Why? Because even though everyone agreed on what should be done, uh, people were hesitant to move because they couldn't sort out, well, what really does state aid, industry aid altogether mean? And in the end, even though university agreed, we had to go to Brussels to get an opinion. And after going to Brussels, still some people were reluctant to act. So then after three years, the coalition of about a dozen companies we had brought together ready to write checks and send 
money to make this happen all dissipated. Uh, again, the importance of a sense of urgency and agility. So that's the I. C is cyber. Uh, and all things cybersecurity. As we think about data and things connected, uh, we need to really think about how we protect that information. Uh, there are new DFARS today and anything funded by DOD, NIST standards on how you do two-factor authentication, uh, whitelist versus bl and blacklist and things of that fashion. So now all of a sudden, while a lot of what we're trying to do is promote collaboration, a lot of the new things are gonna create segmentation and make it hard. Third, the E is export control. Uh, again, for those of us in the defense world, industrial, it overlaps. I can do work in my center in Europe. They could be all created there. If I bring it to the U.S., I can't send that same document back that they created there if it's actually in a certain space. Uh, and I can't tell you how the complexity of managing all that is a fundamental barrier to collaboration. It's important that we manage it well, but it's key. So if you think about the smartphone debate of privacy versus security, this introduces the notion of openness versus security, and it's one we have to think through. Uh, the prior talks talked a lot about trends in the future, so I won't spend time on that. Uh, certainly we see, you know, I like the notion of themes, urbanization, global air travel is changing what's happening around the globe. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to think through some of these things in a different way. We spend probably 80 to 90% of our lives indoors. You know, so the focus on the impact of indoor air quality uh, on cognitive performance and behavior, a nice Harvard study came out on this, is sort of pointing us in a different direction. Air travel, all of us in this room probably won't realize this statistic because we take it for granted, but over 80% of the world has never been on an airplane. So if you think about modernization and move to cities, the cities around the globe having to connect them, and you think about air travel, as I said at a commencement speech at one university, I said there's more to the world than just the web. Uh, and you know, the movement of people and the goods and things that fashion, there's a lot of innovation needed there. Food, moving food around. If you associated the energy cost with food that's wasted, and you thought about the environment, environmental impact on the carbon cost, and you call that a country, the energy cost associated with food waste, it would be the third largest emitter in the world. Uh, I recommend the book to you, Food Foolish by John Mandyke. Talks about uh, that being key. Um, so certainly in terms of technology trends, autonomous intelligent systems, manufacturing, cyber physical, what I would say uh, as a point with regard as we think about all these trends which will come up, there are two overlays that I think are changing how these centers might need to have an emphasis that's different in the future. One is systems thinking, uh, systems context. So often we ask people to think about systems, uh, but when the systems part needs to be integrated e from the fundamental beginning. A material can be great, you can improve those properties when you integrate in a device, a lot of the performance falls apart. You need to have that system context from the beginning. Uh, and so it's not so much about putting discipline side by side, multidisciplinary only, but it's about the science of integration. How do you formally connect the dots with models, with thinking about things over their life cycle as they move across? So along with systems, the second thing I would add is the dimension of the person. A lot of our work is on technology, but the human really matters. So people's experience in the B2C world of what they can do with their phone and touching things is affecting people's expectation in the B2B world. And a lot of it is about uh, behavior, the connectivity to people, and so the human dimension of that, even all the autonomy, as NSF has rightly recognized, is not just about autonomous systems by themselves, but it's human-centered robotics, the co-robots and that. Uh, so in wrapping up, what I would say in terms of models and thinking about things in the future, uh, I would say there needs to be greater engagement of industry and university. So as uh, actually others said earlier, you know, things that are beyond just industry sitting on a panel, meeting twice a year in advisory, but side by side working together and taking the barriers away that enable that, that's key. I think in terms of takeaways and having that research sustain and be useful for the long haul, uh, there's certainly the importance of data. It's amazing to me all these things that are worked on, and you say, oh, I should just go interrogate this database, how it doesn't exist. High quality data, anything from building energy efficiency to supply chain and things that fashion, even within our own company, you'd say I should be able to have that, but it's not easily accessible. Having that in the centers would be key. And then having not just the product, and this now you think about incentives, be papers and students, but also what are the deliverables in terms of models and tools uh, that come out of that. So, so again, I think the centers are fantastic. They're important. They provide critical mass. They provide focus. There are, in fact, challenges that are evolving 
in the area of IP, cyber, and export. As we think about trends in the future, I think an overlay of systems, not just giving acquiescence to it or writing it in the introduction, but really an integral part of how things are done. The impact on people being people being a part of that system. And then thinking about models in the future, really encouraging and enabling greater engagement. Uh, and then also thinking about model-based and how that data can be archived for the long haul.